So now that we're sufficiently lucky to have a second expectant hush, we'll kick off the Law Apps Awards Night for 2019. My name is Pip Nicholson. I'm the Dean of the Melbourne Law School, also one of your judges on a very eminent panel tonight, and it's a particular pleasure to welcome you all. Can we first commence by acknowledging that we meet on the land of the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation and pay our respects to their elders past and present, and also extend a warm welcome to Indigenous peoples who join us for this evening's awards night, and indeed for the work we've done with partner organisations from uh, the Indigenous community legal sector in tonight's or this semester's iteration of Law Apps. I want to commence by acknowledging our sponsors who are very generous in very uh, many different ways for the subject Law Apps taught at the Melbourne Law School. In the first instance, I'd like to thank Herbert Smith Freehills, uh, not only for coming tonight, supporting the prize, supporting the subject and judging, but also for contributing to the teaching of the subject. And I think some of you have met a couple of uh, the people from Her Herbert Smith Freehills, including Alan, uh, across semester one, 2019. So a particular thanks, Alan, to you and to the firm. Can I also thank uh, as we do with each iteration of this subject, also Neota Logic and John Lord uh, and other members of your team that are here tonight. This subject is a tech subject. It has a dependency on technical advice and technical support. We get a lot of support for the subject as, a, as, a, as an idea, as a concept, as a way of bringing you your wonderful young minds to the design and development of apps, but we also get a lot of really practical uh, guidance and support from Neotologic and we're indebted to you also for that. So thank you, John. So. Uh, your supporters will also be your judges tonight. Uh, <laughs> I think you're familiar with the panellists. Uh, they've both contributed to the class. John spent some time with you as well, but John and Alan together with myself, a digital tech freak, will uh, be, be your panel this evening. Some of you will understand the irony of, of that uh, characterisation of myself. Um, we understand as a community, both as a community of the law school, the staff and its students, but this group of students in particular, I think, understands that digital disruption is reshaping the relationship between citizens, states, regulators and private firms. And we as a law school need to ensure that our students, graduates, the former professionals that will populate the legal sector and beyond can contribute to conceiving both in terms of design and leading change and engaging with the impacts of digital disruption. And I see this subject as a very significant part of that offering. I do on that note want to thank the convener of the subject, Gary Caslay, who first introduced Law Apps in 2015. And I know that Gary gets an extraordinary amount of pleasure out of working with each of you in your teams and on your particular applications. But Gary, thanks for your ongoing enthusiasm for the subject. Coming back to the broader question of how we as a law school try and steward and contribute to the ways in which we can mediate, ameliorate, but also challenge our thinking around digital disruption. Last year, various of my academic colleagues established the Digital Citizens Research Network, which brings together researchers uh, with expertise across the legal sector from consumer and competition law, the health law sector, banking and finance, uh, employment law and environmental law, all of whom are studying the impact of technology and innovation on their field. And in July, the network will host its inaugural Digi Digital Citizens Network Conference. And I encourage students to uh, come along to that particular conference if indeed uh, this subject or any of your other learning along the way has sparked your interest in this vital area. As I said before, Law Apps has been taught since 2015. I think all of you in the room understand the ambition of the subject, but I'll restate it so that we, I am clear that we do all understand the ambition of the subject. And that is that 
students are introduced to the fundamentals of humans-centred design and then build applications that aim to increase access to justice in the community. And significantly, those access to justice initiatives and designs that result are in the first instance seeded and then shepherded by the collaboration with the not-for-profit uh, organisation, which identifies an issue or a challenge with which they hope uh, the collaboration can produce a solution. So you identify a common legal problem that can be answered through a series of structured questions and then build using the neotelagic platform an application that can be used by the clients of uh, the not-for-profit organisations. So the final group of people to whom I want to extend my sincere thanks are our collaborators in uh, law apps. It is uh, always a pressure in the not-for-profit sector where to spend your time and where your people can spend their energy. And we deeply appreciate your commitment to building student capacity and solutions uh, in the access to justice sector. And I thank you for your collaboration and we look forward to working with you in partnership into the future. I'm now going to hand over to Gary, who I think will give us some marching orders about how tonight uh, unfolds. The judging panel is acutely aware that it has to limit its questions. So be prepared for one to two highly challenging and probing questions, but we have undertaken, as between ourselves, to try and limit uh, the, 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 the range of questions that we put to each group. So good luck, and we look forward to result at the end of the evening. Thank you, Pip. It's not often that I get an opportunity to tell a dean to shut up. So tonight is that opportunity, and that's really why we have this event uh, broadcast every year. So I get to say to the dean, could you just, that's enough, thanks very much. Um, so uh, welcome to the fifth annual opportunity for me to do that. My name's Gary Cazalet, and um, I take great pleasure in welcoming you here tonight. I'd like to welcome the judges and to the students and the collaborators, families and friends that are here and for people that are watching uh, here in Australia and overseas and probably forever on YouTube as well. I want to make a particular uh, welcome to Angela Carroll, who's come all the way from Townsville today um, from the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders Women's Legal Service. Um, it was 26.6 degrees at three o'clock today in Townsville and six degrees in Melbourne. So thank you so much for coming and thank you, Dean, for uh, assisting the support to bring Angela down today. Tonight, students will compete for the best uh, app for the Herbert Smith Freehills Award for the best law app. And it'll be decided by the panel of judges um, over to my right. Tonight, we're also doing something new. We're introducing an audience award. You and people watching at home will have the opportunity at the end of the evening when the judges go to deliberate to choose the best app. There will be a login. Don't log in now because it's not open and you haven't seen the apps. So if you're <laughs> logging in for your best friend, don't do it now. Uh, do it at the end. Uh, you are only allowed to vote once and you vote for the best app. But to tonight we're going to have the first time for the People's Choice Award. As the Dean said, the primary purpose of this subject, or at least uh, outwardly speaking, is to make the law more accessible and understandable by the Australian community. And with the support of Herbert Smith Freehills, we've been able to increase this subject um, last year by 50% and this year by double. Uh, we are teaching it in first semester and second semester. This subject started with 15 students five years ago. This year we've got 60 students and it's oversubscribed again. So that is a, a wonderful testament. When you see the amount of work that the students have put in, which you will see tonight, you may wonder why they even bother enrolling, because it's an incredible amount of work, but they do and they seem to enjoy it, or that's what they tell me as well. So in the subject, as the deans mentioned, they work in teams. Um, the groups that you saw on the panel before are groups that applied to us and said we would like teams to work with us to build applications for us. Um, they were, the students were told what those applications were and they put in their preferences and by and large they got their first or their second preferences. So the students wanted to work with these organisations. Sometimes lawyers are criticised for not understanding their clients, 
Sometimes they're criticised for not understanding their clients' needs and communicating in a way that their clients understand. At the heart of this subject is working with clients and their organisations to design applications that the end user will understand. That's the primary purpose, one of the primary purposes, and a technology subject, you can be sure that the technology is going to have some problems at some point tonight. Um, so I think that you'll see, and I hope that you'll see over tonight, how much work that students have put into understanding their needs, doing iteration after iteration of these applications, and coming up with things that are, frankly, I think, outstanding. Um, as the Dean said, I'd like to thank Herbert smith Friels. I'd also like to thank Neota and the people at Neota, John Lord, Julian Ubergang, uh, and Kenji Yamada for their support in this subject. The staff at the, at the Law School, I'd also like to thank for their support. The final thanks, other than the organisations who have been thanked, are the students. It is really quite extraordinary. Um, I'm always blown away, and blown away even more this year and this semester, by, by what they've achieved over a very short period of time. So I'll just briefly introduce the judges. We have Alan Peckham, who's the Chief Administrative Officer of Herbert Smith Freehills. He came and spoke to our class a few weeks ago. We have John Lord, who's the Group Chairman of Neota Logic, and he supported me and the subject from day one and before day one that this subject was even thought of at the law school. And Professor Pip Nicholson, who was the first speaker, and she supported this subject, supported the expansion of the subject, and supported me personally in this subject. So I'd like to thank you as well. So thank you for agreeing. Each team will have a maximum of nine minutes. We have a timekeeper here. She's going to be holding up a card and she's going to put up a card to tell people to stop if they go over time. It's to be followed by three minutes of judges' questions. Um, I'm not going to hold up a card for them, but you know we'll keep an eye on them as well. Um, and uh, so we will move on to the first of the presentations. So the first presentation, um, hopefully you've got a program, um, is from um, West Heidelberg Community Legal Ser uh, Service, the Money Safety Map. Good evening, everyone. Um, my name is Hayley Chen. Beside me tonight, I have Jenny Nguyen, Rafael Oliva, and Samantha Marx. Together, we have been working alongside West Heidelberg Community Legal Service to create the Money Safety Map. Um, the app addresses a very specific and rather overlooked area of family violence, namely financial and economic abuse. There is a blanket of unfamiliarity um, surrounding economic abuse, and as a result, the patterns of this uh, abuse can be difficult to identify. Victims sometimes don't know what they're experiencing is a category of family violence. Um, while there are apps that address family violence generally, none are specific to this economic abuse or offer personalized information. Also, there are limited resources that can be provided to victims who are seeking help and want to break free from financially constraining relationships. So to address this gap in legal services, our clients sought to produce an app that could help victims identify, understand, and overcome financial abuse. This led us to the creation of our money safety app. The app sets out to educate the users on economic abuse and potential implications. It then asks the user to answer a series of questions to determine what information is relevant to the circumstances. And once completed, the app produces a customized report which outlines the necessary information and resources that will help, help them to gain financial independence safely. In the production of the app, we determined that our target audience consisted of a subset of economic abuse victims who are ineligible for free legal aid but cannot afford legal help on their own. We cannot specifically address the intricacies of their situation through the app. However, it is able to provide users with bespoke guidance on what, um, what services they should look into, how to maximize those services, and how to manage particular aspects of their finances. We will illustrate the app using a hypothetical scenario featuring Jane. Jane is married with children and have come to feel incredibly constrained in her relationship, but she's scared to leave as her husband deals with their finances. She has come into West Heidelberg Community Legal Service for support and has been directed to the money safety map. So I will now hand you over to Jenny, who will take you through our money safety map. So when Jane opens the app, she is greeted with a home page featuring a moving image. We've made these GIFs as we wanted users to be greeted with a welcoming and supportive message. 
The focus in our app lies in three things. Firstly, simplicity. Secondly, the creation of an inviting atmosphere. And thirdly, the optimization of a user-friendly experience. The header at the top depicts a map so that Jane is reminded that dealing with her issue will be a journey and that our app will provide her with direction. We understand that users such as Jane will be in an emotionally sensitive state and so we've chosen to hand draw a lot of our images to humanise the process and connect to the user. Notice that the personal safety message about dialing triple zero um, here is also present at the very bottom of the footer at all times. With safety at the forefront, Jane is also given an estimation of time to set aside so she can plan ahead and complete the app safely. Early on, Jane is alerted to all the safety features within the app, such as our quick exit button, which is consistently visible and accessible as the header remains static wherever the user scrolls. If Jane feels unsafe, she can click on quick exit to immediately close the app and be redirected to a web website. To accommodate a wide range of users with varying degrees of literacy and knowledge, we've ensured terms requiring um, clarification have a hover definition so that users have the utmost understanding. Throughout the app, we've refrained from having Jane input personal information. This not only maintains privacy, but opens up access to a range of social workers and friends of victims, such as Jane, to use the app on their behalf. This reassures users such as Jane that she will not be identified as a user. We've made a note uh, within our app on this page that users who are or have been in intimate partner relationships will be the ta um, tailored will be, will be the audience that our app is tailored towards. However, we also let users who are not in such situations know that they may still benefit from the information provided. Um, Jane is given the option to learn more about economic abuse, and if selected, she is provided with a definition and examples of uh, financial abuse so she can um, identify her issue. The examples range from straightforward scenarios of economic abuse to wider, more subtle and less obvious ones. The app then takes Jane through a series of questions correlated to key variables that may impact her journey to financial independence. For safety, we've implemented a progress bar at the very top of the page so that Jane has an indication of how she is tracking throughout the app, which is also pinpointed by images reflective of various issues. This also is designed to make the process less daunting. All buttons that, uh, when clicked, trigger the next question to optimise time and ease of process. Each variable consists of different patterns of questioning and follow-up questions will differ according to the user's previous response. Um, this kind of response-driven questioning uh, eliminates the user from having to answer an abundance of irrelevant questions. A lot of the logic uh, we have placed behind in the back end, so that in the front end, the user has to do less. Jane will be able to quickly complete a few more pages of questioning, and then she'll end up with her money map report. I will now um, uh, hand over to my colleague, Raf, who will take you through the report. So following her journey through the app, Jane has now arrived at her money safety map. The report consists of customised legal information addressing Jane's circumstances and provides her with a variety of resources and information. It seeks to enable Jane to remove herself and anybody she cares for from her current situation safely, armed with an awareness of her obligations, with confidence and the necessary tools to assist her in the process. So as we can see, the report is split into two main parts. The first part is what we consider the map. This breaks everything Jane may wish to do down by category. And then within each category, Jane is given a list of steps that she can tick off. Every user will be prompted at the first box to determine if they are eligible for free legal aid and to also consider whether West Heidelberg is their local CRC. The next few sections will address Jane's situation specifically. The output of information displayed in each drop-down has been triggered by the answers she selected while working through the app. As you can see, each section is in a drop-down bar so that Jane can navigate through her report easily and is not overwhelmed with slabs of information that appear unclear or off-putting. We wanted each user to feel as if overcoming this issue isn't incredibly complicated, hence the decision to break it down and allow them to digest information. The checklists also provide factual information addressing common concerns users may have. For example, it is a common misconception that if your home is not in your name, you may have no claim to it. Here, Jane is made aware of the facts as reassurance that the following steps are still worthwhile. 
We've included handy tips throughout the app that may address common safety concerns associated with dealing with services and tips on how to navigate them with ease. Where appropriate, Jane may also see a warning pop-up. The resource centres referred to in the report are hyperlinked where possible and can take Jane directly to their webpage. This saves her wasting time trying to navigate through various websites and helps her find the correct source. The second part of the report is distributed to every user. The information in this part is not specific to Jane's circumstances, but provides useful strategies and information relevant to her journey as a whole. Some of the information we felt useful to all users includes how they can access legal services. This addresses the requirement in the first checklist box at the start of the report and was prompted earlier in the app. They are also given tips on how their finances, on how to handle their finances when they separate, preventing economic abuse, some free services and additional resources. A particularly useful part of this section of the report is the document information drop down, which provides Jane with a list of important documents that she may wish to get in order and how she can do so. At the conclusion of the report, Jane has the option to email herself a copy. This is the only place in the app where Jane might be asked to input personal information. If she chooses to do so, she will be sent a, PD a PDF and a Word version to her designated email. In the instance she does not want to email the report at all, she can print it directly from the web page, in which we've provided instructions on how to do so, or she can open the PDF and Word and print them directly from there. This brings us to the conclusion of our demonstration, and we now like to open the judges panel for questioning. Um, that was amazing. I, I, I... There's a lot of empathy in the imagery that you've used, which I really liked. Um, I think the quick exit functionality is, it, it's a great touch. Um, I had a sneak peek at this earlier and had a quiet chuckle when it went to the weather map as well. I think it's <laughs> yeah, very well done. Um, and the smiley face graphic is, uh, yeah, it, it, it's very welcoming, which I think is one of the things you were trying Thank to you. get across, which is fantastic. Um, obviously a really difficult user group to go and try and test this with. So how did you go about doing that? And what did you learn out of that process that is then reflected in the app? Um, our clients at West Heidelberg were really welcoming. Um, yeah. They allowed us to go to the service, um, the centre in West Heidelberg and head into their waiting room. So on, a, um, on one occasion in particular, we went in and we just showed what we had of the app to people in the waiting room. And we were right. fortunate enough to see that a few of them had dealt with financial and economic abuse situations. Mm -hmm. um, they helped us a lot in terms of design. And in particular, we also wanted to include, based on their stories, the option that uh, so social workers can work through the app with them and that financial mm -hmm. and economic abuse isn't only for intimate partner relationships. A lot of our users um, found that they were, it was a close family member like their son or that they were elderly and other people were trying to take advantage of them. So that's how we went about user testing. We also sent a link to the, um, our clients and they yeah. continued to use the test while we couldn't go directly there. Yeah, fantastic, well done. Mm -hmm. um, Leave it there. Yeah. We're, we're delighted. Thank you very much. We're ready for the next group. Thank you. Thank you. If I could get the next group up, which is the Australian Lawyers for Remote Aboriginal Rights Group. Uh, we'd like to begin by acknowledging that the land on which the law school sits is traditionally owned by the Wundjeri people, the Kulin Nations. We pay our respects to their elders past, present and forthcoming and we also pay our respects to any Indigenous people in the room and we feel that that's important for us to do so considering the content of our app. Um, so my name is Jack, um, Jack Senefsek. I'm accompanied by Ayrton Roy. This is Vivian Lim next to him. Uh, April Whitehead is next to her and then at the end is Sophie Clappin. Our client is Australian Lawyers for Remote Aboriginal Rights. For the last four years, Aura has been addressing a public housing crisis in remote Aboriginal communities in the Northern Territory. The Northern Territory government, being the landlord for the residents in these communities, has failed to attend to any of the repairs that the residents in the housing, public housing have requested. These repairs are by no means trivial. For example, a common issue is that tenants' air conditioners may have been broken for well over a year, um, and this isn't a part of the country gets, that gets hit by 45 degree heat in the summer. El Rao decided to start combating this crisis in 2015 by starting in the Santa Teresa community, which is located in the southwestern uh, Northern Territory. 
Um, this involved volunteers from Al Rock taking several trips to Santa Teresa, um, going to every single house in the community with pen and paper in hand, collecting all the tenants' personal information, manually writing down all the repairs that are needed, and taking photos of those repairs with their phone. That wasn't the end of the process because they would return to their office with a mess of documents and begin the painstaking task of trying to link up all those individual repairs to the photos on their phone and then to collate all that information into a cohesive document. Ultimately, all this um, culminated in litigation in the Northern Territory Tribunal. And finally, in February of this year, the tribunal made a significant compensation order thanks to the phenomenal efforts of L. Rose lawyers led by uh, Barrister Matt Albert and Principal Solicitor Dan Kelly. This process, process took over four years and is estimated to have costed pro bono legal costs of around $400,000. Now, Santa Teresa is just one community, and they are by no means an anomaly. This is a widespread issue throughout all of the remote uh, Aboriginal communities in Northern Territory. Um, obviously, four years is not feasible for every single community, especially since more litigation is likely. So the purpose of our app is to provide a simple way for LRAR volunteers to collect all information, log all repairs, collect all photos needed, and produce all uh, the necessary documents to submit to both the de Department of Housing and to the Northern Territory Tribunal in one go. So I'm going to talk about the process of the app a little bit. It's impossible for us to actually go through all of the app because it is immense. This diagram is just meant to evidence how big it is. Um, so you can see the orange boxes at the bottom are represented by rooms. The purple items are all items in need of repair. The red items are how those particular items might need repair. And the pink items are all the information that you have to gather from that. And that has to be expanded across every single orange block that you see on the screen. I'll now hand it over to Vivian Lim, who will talk about the app design. Thank you, John. Um, before I can take you through the app, we would like to quickly highlight a few of the design choices that we have made. First, our user is the Aura volunteer or lawyer, not a tenant. However, the questions in this app are still directed at a tenant because it is designed to be read to, out to them as a tenant takes them through their case. Second, the app is designed for mobile use because it will be used out in the field. This informed a lot of our design choices. For example, we use Arial as the main font in our apps as it is compatible across all mobile devices. Third, in terms of, in terms of aesthetic, we took our colors from the Aboriginal flag and the natural landscape. I incorporated many of these colors in our progress cards and designs, and now I'll pass it on to Ayrton. Thank you. All right. <clears throat> I'm now just going to give you a quick run through of the app. The app's obviously huge, so I can't give you a full run through like we'd really want to, but I'm going to try to give you the best overview that we can. So up to the beginning screen, the app will just begin with a basic disclaimer uh, and the volunteer will just read that out to the tenant so they know what the app's going to be doing and it has to be agreed to before the app will continue. Uh, then the volunteer information needs to be logged. This will be the first bit of information that's logged and it's actually the volunteer's information who's filling out the app. Uh, this is because we need Alra to have a record of who's filling out the repairs for which house. So that if they need to get in contact with them to ask them about that house or about the tenant, it's easy and all the information's there. All right, moving on, we move into the real meat of the app and it's starting to collect the personal information. Uh, the section is quite big and we've filled in a lot of default answers just so we can show you it all, but obviously it's all customizable and free filling when you do the app yourself. Uh, so we will just fill in the very start. So we'll come up with a hypothetical tenant. We'll call her Marley Hope, female, date of birth, All right, she's ready to start blogging her information. Uh, as you can see, this section of the app really starts to collect a lot of detailed information about the tenant, including their education, their uh, proficiency in English, and all the meetings they've had with the Department of Housing, especially including the first one in which they signed the lease paperwork for their house. The reason we do this is because this info was collected and it was necessary to ground an Amadio style defense uh, in this original Santa Teresa litigation uh, because a counterclaim was launched against Alra by the, uh, sorry, against the tenants by the Department of Housing. All right, the next part of the app is section two, and this is going to start logging the actual repairs that are needed. Uh, the, it begins outside the property, and the app's just going to take the tenant and the lawyer, sorry, the volunteer and the tenant through the property. Uh, we're going to log a repair for you live just so you can see how it works. Uh, so you click 
Here we've got the fence surrounding the property. Yes, there is an issue with the fence. Uh, we'll select missing sections here. Uh, but then, as you can see, if we had selected damage as well to describe the issue as in two separate issues, it would create both beneath. Uh, and now we can continue on to fill it in. Uh, the first thing is, has it been reported to the landlord before? This is really important. Uh, it's going to ask how it was reported, when it was reported, and we've got a little uh, explanation of the best form to put that in. Uh, we'll then ask how the repair, how the damage has impacted the tenant. Uh, this is really important for one of the later outputs that you're going to see. Uh, next, it will ask, Next, we'll actually ask for two photos. Uh, this is used on a mobile, and when that button's pressed on a mobile, it will bring up the camera automatically, so two photos can be taken. It will also give the option to upload one from gallery in case there's already a photo on the phone. The next and final part of logging a single repair is that the repair will need to be categorised under the Act. And the reason this is done is because different classifications under the Act for different repairs give different kind of compensation. We envision, and in communication with AURA, the volunteers who go out to the Northern Territories are gonna have a small induction beforehand, and they'll be trained in how to classify which repairs under which section. So we haven't included hints or tips for how to do that on the app. All right, so if we continue through, it's gonna take the, the volunteer and the tenant all the way through the outside of the property. This includes any issues that might be with the fence, the pathway, the external drains, the roof, the exterior wall, and any other external issue that they need to enter. As you can see, we've had default answers preloaded for all of these. It's just to save time in presenting, but again, it can be filled in in so many ways. All right, the last part of the app, or the last data entry part of the app, will be the internal repairs. Uh, and this will begin with general repairs, which we'll load in a second. Uh, the reason we've started with general repairs, uh, as you'll see, is after talking to our client, these are the most serious and a lot of the time the most common issues. Uh, so we want to make sure they're addressed by the volunteer and the tenant and they're logged if they are issues in the house. This includes stuff such as the air conditioner not working, the plumbing not working, no connection to electricity, mold, pests, really serious issues that we want to make sure are logged in the app when, the, uh, when it's run through. Next, it will take the tenant and the volunteer to the electricity box. The reason for this is that the landlord's information or the government's information is normally stored there so that they can contact for repairs. But a lot of the time, the problem is it isn't, and there was actually no way for them to log the repair themselves. So we just want to make sure we get a photo of that if there is, or it's recorded that there was no contact information in case it wasn't there. The app will then take the tenant and the volunteer room by room through the house to log every single repair in every single instance. The reason we've gone through room by room is because after conversation with our art, a lot of the time the tenants don't know that something can be fixed or it's been in disrepair for so long they've almost forgotten about it. And so this is just to make sure that literally everything that's wrong with the house we can get logged. Now as you can see, there's about seven rooms. Uh, they're quite basic and we've skipped through. That. Well, as you can see, they all have many options and these all fully work, uh, but we've skipped through some of the rooms just because we need to save time. Uh, and also we understand that not all houses in the Northern Territories are gonna have a dining room and a living room. We've just created a one bedroom room uh, for the sake of completeness, a one bedroom house for the sake of completeness, sorry. Uh, Right, so then at the end of that, it will thank you for logging your repairs and it will begin to collate the information and create the outputs. So now I'm going to hand over to April and she is going to talk you through all the outputs that all this information has created. So after the repair living is complete, an email is sent to Alra with five documents, each tailored based on the information that the logger has put into the app. We'll now open up the email that has been received. So as you can see, the email itself includes uh, the name and community of the tenant whose repairs have been logged, and their name is also included in the subject title to aid in easy retrieval. As you can also see, each of the documents have, that have been generated by the app are attached to this email. 
as a preliminary point, you'll see that all of the documents have been generated in Word format. This is because it allows LRA solicitors to make any changes necessary to these documents before sending them off to the relevant parties or submitting them to the tribunal. We'll first open up the letter to the Department of Housing. So by law, the Department of Housing, which is the landlord, must give 14 days written notice of an item in need of repair, unless if the repair is classed as an emergency repair, uh, before the tenant may apply to the tribunal to order the repairs. This document is therefore a critical first step in the process of seeking the repairs. You'll see that the tenant's basic details have been taken from what we've input into the app, but the more complex part of this document uh, is the table. You'll immediately see that there are a number of empty rows in this table. These exist to account for, uh, sorry, these exist to account for other potential repairs that the logger may have selected when moving through the app and can be quickly and easily removed by the LRA solicitor in a matter of seconds. The emergency repairs column has also been left empty for the solicitor to manually fill. We did contemplate including a variable that would allow the volunteer to uh, select or indicate if a repair should be classed as an emergency repair, but we decided that this was something that was better left to the LRA solicitors given the significant legal consequences of a repair being classed as emergency. As you can see, the repairs that we logged in the app are the ones that are produced in the table. So for example, that first repair we logged uh, with regard to the fence missing sections and the horses getting into the property is what you can see in the first row of the table. So proceedings in the tribunal will not necessarily be initiated for each and every tenant. However, we've been advised by our client that the Department of Housing often fails to respond to the letter of notice within the statutory time limit. And so we've therefore developed the app so that it can produce the documents needed for the application to the tribunal in the event that this is required. First, we have the initiating application to the tribunal and the letter requesting that the fee be waived for this application. Again, all of the personal information about the tenant needed for these applications is taken directly from the app. The initiating application has also been produced in the exact format required for the tribunal so that it's uh, perfectly ready to go. And fourth, the unattested declaration, which effectively acts as a witness statement from the tenant in the potential litigation. This was the largest and the most complex of the outputs to produce. While the document before you looks clean and concise, the template required to produce it involved over 700 conditionals and 2,000 plus unique data points. And the template document, which accounted for all potential variations, was 17 pages long. We built the template to ensure that, so far as possible, it reads smoothly, as a witness statement should, despite the fact that everything you see here uh, has been taken directly from data that we've input into the app. So it's an automated document, yet uh, it, it reads pretty nicely as a witness statement. You'll see that the first section details the tenant's personal history, education background, and their interactions with the Department of Housing. And as mentioned by Ayrton, this information was required to ground the Amadio defence in the litigation. It then moves on to detail the repairs needed in the house, the impact of these on the tenant, and whether or not these issues have already been reported to the landlord. And lastly, Alra will be sent a spreadsheet containing all information collected by the loggers session in the app, set out in a clear, easy to read format. This acts as a detailed profile of each tenant who has been through the repair logger and will be used for Alra's internal purposes. It is also where the photos of all the items in need of repair are located meaning that they can be easily found when needed to attach as evidence for proceedings in the tribunal. For the purposes of this presentation, we haven't uploaded any photos yet, but if we had, these would come through as a hyperlink in the HTML format uh, of the collated information and can then be easily opened and saved by the Alra solicitor. So as you can see, not only is our app collecting all the tenant's personal information and logging all repairs, it's also generating all of the documents needed to take the next steps in combating the public housing crisis across remote Aboriginal communities. I'll now hand over to Sophie, who will conclude. Um, that concludes the substantive part of our presentation. We would like to take this opportunity to thank our content experts, Dan Kelly at ALRA and Matthew Albert from the Victorian Bar, who worked closely with us during the app build. We'd also like to thank the team at NEOTA, Kenji, our teaching assistants, Shah and Ben, and of course, Gary, without whom this fantastic subject would not be possible. Thank you so much. Oh, that was fantastic. Um, we've been sharing our insights over here. Um, 
I'd really like to say the way you set out the challenge for this particular collaboration and design uh, was excellent, really helped uh, me to understand the precise focus of y your development. Just a couple of questions, some of which might take you a little bit beyond the presentation. Sitting behind what you sourced through the app, is there a data set and um, how, if there is a data set, can that be used to feed broader policy debates around um, housing issues in the sector? That's just a question, it's a curiosity mm -hmm. that I have. It's also clear with the, the way that you've carefully considered and transferred your information retrieval into the legal documents that are necessary complaint, litigation, tribunal, um, that there was a lot of thought that went into that and there was a lot of scoping and then drilling back to retrieve. Do you have any thoughts or insights into how much legal time is saved as a result of, of the systems and the, the documents that you're generating? So one is a broader question, maybe a little bit unfair, but I'm so curious I have to ask. And, and the, the other is a very fair question in all the circumstances. Yeah, so for the first question, there is a collated information document that takes every single thing that was input into the app and gives it to um, the LRAR solicitors. In terms of whether that can be used to feed a broader kind of policy debate on Indigenous housing, um, it would have to be something that would be consented to by the actual users. So that would be an incredibly necessary component to it because you can imagine that this might be some sensitive information. Um, and then that would have to be something that the client would decide themselves. Um, as to the second question... Second question was, what estimate do you have on saving of legal yeah, time? Yeah, well, look, I'm probably not best placed to really answer that question just because, I mean, it was Dan Kelly and the team at LRA that put in the long four-year process in doing so. Yeah. But I would like to think it saved you many, many, many hours, and it will save you many, many, many hours. Uh, just, just from really small administrative tasks like linking the photos yeah, to the that repairs. that was beautiful. We all yeah, liked that. Because uh, just in talking to LRA, after writing all the reports, writing all the repairs, taking all the photos, just sitting down and working out which photo was from yeah. which house to which yeah. repair, it's just, it's, it can be a nightmare. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the kind of thing this app is really gonna save time. And I think producing all that onto legal documents on top of that is just, you know, it's just really helpful. Yeah, really well done. Thank you. I think you can understand that they'll probably never spend any time in a maze again. Um, there was so much involved in that. So our next group, which I'm about to call up, is um, Peninsula Community Legal Centre uh, Young Renters' Rights. Good evening, everybody. It is our great honour here to introduce you with our app, the Young Renters' Rights Education Programme. My name is Jazz, here is Josh, Andy, and Iris. Um, now I'm going to just quickly introduce you what's going to happen in the next nine minutes. So after this brief introduction by me, which is very boring, um, my group mate, Iris, is going to introduce you with the educational part of this program, and um, Josh is going to introduce you with the quiz and certificate part, and then Andy will conclude to tonight's presentation. So young renters in Victoria can face a lot of difficulties. As international students, we have all faced, um, four of us in our team has all faced this um, great struggle of trying to find a rental first, for the first time in Victoria, especially facing the short age of supply of the rentals. So that's why um, we are so personally related and dedicated into this program that will help the people like us to have a better life when they first come to Australia or first come to Victoria. So um, our app content is basic, basically based on a program run by our client, Peninsula Community Legal Centre previously, and they give us uh, intensive instructions on how to um, construct this app. So the app is actually divided into two parts. The first part is an educational part, which 
we introduce the young tenant or any person who is interested on the basic legal rights and responsibility they need to undertake as a tenant in Victoria. And secondly, when they complete this educational part, they'll be led to a quiz part. And if they complete this quiz successfully, they will be given a certificate from PCLC. This is to certif certify that they gained adequate knowledge to understand what's their rights and responsibility and will be a reliable tenant and when they hand this certificate to the real estate agent, they'll be highly likely they will be granted a lease, even though they have no experience in the rental market at all. And Andy is going to now introduce you for what we have done to put this all together. Thank you, Chas. So here's our project timeline. So we have been working on this app for two months now. And during that time, we had a great opportunities to visit the VCAT in Dandenong. Uh, to attend four different hearings about the conflict between the tenants and the landlord. And over there, we talked to the, land, the tenant, the landlord, the VCAT members, and the real estate agent to understand more about the issue of the app. And they gave us advice on how to approach our target user and how to address the issues of the app. And by May 16, we were able to complete our first version. And we had our user testing appointment with uh, Wild Lions in Melbourne. Uh, we had like 10 million young volunteers to help us do the user testing and a lot of modification have been made to reflect their feedback. Uh, and so now my teammate will show you our most updated version. So now let's jump right into the app. Okay, so this is our app. And as you may notice that there are several, actually a lot of the little character hand drawn by our team, it is more than 20 images co uh, incorporated and hand-drawn by our teammates um, to illustrate the whole storyline of what we are going to teach our user on their legal concepts so they don't find it is a boring legal app, rather it's a fun, interesting journey they really could enjoy with these little characters. And now we enter into the app and the only qualifications we said is that you have to be in Victoria because the law is based in Victoria and um, or you want to move here. If you have already completed this program before, you can then jump straight, uh, straight away to the quiz part, which saves you roughly 20 to 40 minutes to redo the whole educational part again. And now Eris is just going to introduce you with, um, with the story of Penny. Thank you, Jess. Now, Penny comes to Melbourne and starts her journey to seek rooms. The design philosophy of the app is user-friendly. We create Penny's story and any user who need to seek uh, rooms can find their situation in Penny's story. You can see a brief Penny renting journey in the, uh, in the brochure we provided for the judge. I will mainly introduce the design of the education part now. The whole, pro the whole education part follows the time sequence. We divide the whole process into three parts, before, during, and after the tenancy. The small pencil represents the specific knowledge point we are learning. So now we are at the before tenancy part and the stage of inspection. We also use four iconic to remind or give tips to our users on their responsibilities. We design some pop-ups to help users to understand complex concepts. For example, here, if you hover RTBA, then you can see the full name and explanation, also a RTBA website link. If you click the link, you will be redirected to the RTBA website. Then during the tenancy part, <laughs> During the tenancy part is about a tenant's rights and responsibilities after moving into a new room. We won't show you all the screens in this part. I will show you just one screen. Here, the rights part, we provide a guide including the rights and responsibilities of the tenant and the landlord. If users click guide, then the guide can be downloaded directly. Yeah, here is a guide. Next part is after tenancy part. When Penny decides to leave, she needs to fulfill her responsibility as a tenant and get her bump back. We provide her some advice in different situations she might face before living. We will quickly flick through the rest of the screen because of the time limit. Now our education parts, and then Josh will introduce the quiz and certificate part to you. So 
So I'm going to introduce, go through the whole quiz part today. So uh, in the first screen, uh, the users will know about the introduction of this quiz part. They will know about, they will receive the certificate if they pass the quiz. And uh, our users can just take the quiz. There are 10 questions based on what they have learned from the earlier education part, which Aries addressed. So uh, we already said some default answers for these questions. Um, kind of like those questions are very simple questions. If they read through the education part, they can just easily get past the, this quiz. So after finish the quiz, uh, our, if you, our users fail the quiz, they will say the grade of the quiz and also they will say the explanation part, uh, which we designed based on the feedbacks we received uh, from the user testing of the wildlife volunteers. <coughs> And if our users pass the, pass the quiz, they, they, uh, they can just provide us with their name and address, and then they can just uh, receive the report and the certificate through the email they provide us. And they also get a similar report with the result and the explanation. And with the explanation, they can just uh, review all of the impo important uh, knowledge part of the education part and they want to retake the quiz later. So here's, the, here's our certificate, we designed this. Uh, the background flower comes from Andy's home. And uh, also if our, users, <laughs> uh, if our users want to get some help, they can just find the website of our uh, legal, uh, legal center down, the, down the, this page. And also they can just uh, contact uh, Kirsten from PCLC directly if you want to get some help. And more importantly is that uh, if our users want to find some home to live, they can just go to the real estate agents. They can just show them this certificate. And then the real estate agents will think that uh, these users are very quite reliable, which means it's more easier for our users to find an apartment house in Victoria which is also one of the most important part of our app. Now I'll hand, hand over to Andy for our final thoughts. Okay, so the, our ultimate vision for our app is that it will someday become the prerequisite for all rental agreement, not only in Victoria, but in Australia. And uh, it can also be a very good education program in school because, you know, like the knowledge about responsibilities and rights of a tenant is very important, especially for young people who live in big cities like Melbourne or Sydney, where the housing shortage is like a real problem. And in order to achieve our vision, we suggest three recommendations. The first one is that we want to create a quiz question bank and then we randomize the quiz question. The next one is that we want to add a different language or a couple of different languages. And the last one is that we want to modify the content so that it fits the legislation of different states like New South Wales or Western Australia. So these recommendations conclude our presentation today. We would like to thank you Neotar Logic, PCLC, and y Lions, especially Melbourne Law School, Gary, Ben, Sa, and Kenji for their great support. Uh, so now we are ready for the Q&A session. Thank you, guys. Um, thanks very much. It's, uh, uh, a much larger problem uh, than I would have imagined before tonight. It's a, um, uh, um, and I like the idea of the um, uh, certification uh, process uh, to say that you know this person is aware uh, of their rights and responsibilities, and um, uh, uh, and that's great. When um, when you had the feedback uh, sessions, I think they were uh, sponsored with VCAT. Was that was that correct? Yeah. Yes, um, we we consult um, VCAT members. We consult real estate agents, renters who get into VCAT proceedings, and young renters who are currently seeking home to um, get our feedbacks. Do, um, do you have any idea of the of the volume of um, people yeah, you, that you classify as young renters? I suppose under thirty or. Um, in the marketplace, and then how much um, process? There were, how many? How many cases then find their way into VCAT around these the subject matters in a year? There is not um, statistic currently in Victoria. To our client is trying to collect a number um, for tonight's presentation. But unfortunately, due to an increasing number every single year, and also this 
questions actually haven't been addressed by a lot of the legal sector um, in Victoria that we think um, we can't really provide an exact figure for you tonight. Our client has been running this young program to educate the young people by themselves offline all the time. And then it has been a very successful and popular, um, popular program for them. And there's reason behind it because people can't find a home and they want some legal backup to, to, to show that they are good people and they really want to just get a house. And yeah. I have failed even as a law student three times to apply for a lease. In, uh, in Victoria and in yeah. Brisbane as well. So I think um, it's a common problem just everybody will face. And if you just find a figure of, um, I remember um, reading something um, like there's 33% of the population in Australia currently renting. Yeah. Some of them have experience, some of them don't have it, have it. So our program is designed for every single one who has not yet rent a house before and then help them to get through um, this transaction. It's wonderful. Thank you. Thank you very much. The next group is the group for Flemington Kensington Community Legal Centre, and they will be providing you with an introduction to their police police complaints portal. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Ali Ibrahimi, and I'm joined by Matt Goff, Rajesh Gounder. Alyssa Wong, Rob Gilchrist. We are here tonight to showcase POCO, the Police Complaints Portal. Before we begin, we would first like to thank our lecturer Gary Cazalet, Shah and Ben, the sponsors of this subject, Herbert Smith Freehills and Neota, for allowing us to use their platform. We would also like to voice our sincere appreciation to the team at Flemington Community Legal Centre, Flemken, for giving us the opportunity to be part of their police accountability project, in particular to Gregor Husper and Anthony Kelly. The Police Accountability Project, established by Flem Flemken, is a community-driven initiative seeking to assist people who have experienced police misconduct and more generally campaign for the systemic change that is needed for the greater police accountability. When we first met with Flemken, they expressed that their wish was to streamline the intake and complaint assessment process, as they faced the problem of being unable to keep up with client demand within the initial stages of client contact. In response to this, we have developed POCO, an app which fast tracks the police complaint assessment stage for those able to use this online tool, allowing Flemken to dedicate its already stretched resources to those who need an interpreter or require an in-person interview. What you're looking at now is POCO's opening screen. A minimalistic design, POCO aims to provide an easy to use experience from the get go. After extensive user testing, POCO, is continuous, uh, POCO acknowledges that many of its users would not be tech savvy nor highly proficient in English. And the entire app was built with these considerations at the forefront. Similarly, POCO's users are likely to be experiencing some form of distress or anxiety. Being a victim of police misconduct carries its mental tolls after all. With this in mind, we had to ensure that our design was simple enough so as to not overwhelm our users. As you can see, the opening screen shows two options for users. First, to seek legal advice, and second, to simply tell a story. The option to tell a story is directed to users who may want to tell Flemken about an incident of police misconduct, but who do not wish to seek legal assistance. This allows people to help Flemken lobby for change or perhaps just tell their story and be heard. <coughs> Additionally, you will see a short video in the centre of the opening screen. This video explains POCO's purpose and functionality clearly. Particularly useful for those who may struggle with English and an engaging substitute for an otherwise clunky how this works textual description, which many of our users during user testing raise objections to. Now what we have just described to you um, barely touches the surface. That said, my team and I will now deeply explore with you POCO's intuitive functionalities and features. Rajesh? Thanks, Matt. Let's assume that a user wishes to seek legal help. After the opening screen, the user is shown a legally required disclaimer. So we'll just wait for it to load. So the user is shown a legally required disclaimer and told that the entire process could take up to 30 minutes. So this forewarns them how much time they may need to dedicate to the process. 
It also introduces Poco the Penguin, Poco's mascot. Multiple mascots were contemplated and discussed with both Flemken and would-be users. Ultimately, the penguin was considered the most likable and non-threatening. <laughs> we were also concerned that a mascot might trivialise the seriousness of the subject matter. To alleviate this, we ensured that the mascot was non-intrusive and ancillary to, rather than the focus of, the app. Ultimately, the user testing revealed that people liked the mascot or thought that it softened, softened what would otherwise be a difficult process. Users should keep an eye out for Poco the Penguin, uh, as Poco provides useful hints throughout the app. Next up, the app asks who is using the app. At the outset of development, we wanted to mimic the experience of being interviewed in person. To achieve this, Poco dynamically changes the text of subsequent questions depending on who the user says they are. We really want the user to feel like they're being listened to and interacting with someone real on the other end. The user can also specify at this early stage the kind of help that they seek. Poku then begins to develop an assessment report. You may notice that Poku the Penguin appears at the top of the page in the progress bar. He moves across the progress bar as the user continues through the app, encouraging them to continue. We came up with this idea because we realised that without the guidance of a human voice, users might grow tired and leave the application before they can finish it. If users are having trouble, they can also contact Flemken through the I am having trouble button at the bottom of the page. On this page, the user is asked whether the incident occurred with a Victorian police officer or a PSO. Responding none of the above will render the user ineligible for assistance by Flemken. However, we recognise that the matter is still important, which is why POCO also connects them with an array of other legal resources so that their voices can still be heard. If the incident did involve a Victorian officer, the user will then be shown another question below. This question asks for the location of the incident. As you can see, we have embedded an interactive map so that the user can identify the exact location of their incident or alternatively search for a police station. These functions were included so that the user would have a seamless experience on our platform and that they wouldn't have to leave our app to search for the necessary information. On this page, to assist with users in selecting the summary of their incident, Poco the Penguin us uh, usefully tells the user uh, that this option has an embedded function that if they hover over, there is a brief description and examples in simple English of that specific event. In this case, the user has selected racial discrimination, property damage and injuries. Take note of the latter two as we'll shortly come back to that. The user is finally asked to provide details of their incident. We recognise that it can be overwhelming to ask a user simply what happened. Therefore, POCO reminds the user of their previous uh, selections in red. This is to provide a prompt on the matters that the user might want to include in their free text and therefore providing a guided experience. It also improves the quality of the answers as the user is instructed on the elements that they need to cover in their answer. The user is also able to upload files that may be relevant to their incident, an option which is displayed throughout the app multiple times in different contexts. The app is dynamic in that it changes based on the client's responses, prioritising their answers and catering the experience to them. It only asks relevant questions in order to avoid frustrating the user or overburdening Flemken with unnecessary details. Recall that the user previously indicated that, they, that their incident involved injuries and property damage. Because of this, when the user is asked what details they can provide, these options appear on this page. By this stage, you may have noticed the Your Rights button that appears throughout the app. This acts to tell users about their rights when talking to the police. This feature received some positive feedback during user testing, as many people indicated they are actually unaware of what they could and could not ask the police. Uh, we've also included icons which provide pictorial guidance throughout the app uh, and also give immediate feedback, turning into ticks so that users know when they can proceed. Next, users are asked to provide some optional personal details uh, which help Flemken to identify any vulnerabilities. Um, and then po Poco uh, asks users to check their answers and confirm that they are correct. If the user wishes to change any of their answers, they may do so here without fear of having to lose them or backtrack. Once complete, POCO generates two reports. One is emailed directly to Flemken and the other to the user. 
The assessment report, shown here on the slides, is emailed directly to Flemcan and includes all the information provided by the users along with any attached files or photos. The report is specifically being created and allows for easy identification of the type and time of incident uh, along with any risk factors specific to the user. This was something that was desired in the app as it enhanced efficiency during the intake process. POCO also generates an incident document for the user which they can show to any lawyer or other service without having to repeat their story over and over again. Ultimately, POCO creates an improved outcome for both the user and Flemken as it provides a record of the complaint which can easily be referred to at a later date. Wow, wasn't that amazing? <laughs> <laughs> but there is one more thing. What you have seen so far is a fully functioning desktop version of POCO. But before leaving you today, we would also like to showcase the fully functioning mobile version of the app. Here is a video of our fully functioning app. Oh look, Poco tweeted us. <laughs> <laughs> Through our user testing, we realized that many people have little or no access to desktop or laptop computers and use their phones almost exclusively for all online activities. Compared to our desktop version, the benefits of the mobile version are one, Users can lodge their responses on the go with a customized and friendly interface. Two, users can upload photos and videos directly from their phone. And three, most importantly and most amazingly, ladies and gentlemen, if your smartphone allows dictation, which most do, POCO allows you to dictate your answers without typing a single thing in your phone. Users are able to speak the answers out loud with the text transcribed by the phone throughout the app. This enables people with limited typing skills to complete the app far more efficiently, easily and accurately. It also eliminates the need to use the mobile keyboard to type extended responses, which would be a frustrating experience. Look at that. <laughs> <laughs> now that we have given you an overview of our app, we now welcome any questions. Thank you. Um, just to quote John, that was very cool, well done. Um, I'm actually struggling. I think your attention to detail and the amount of input and, and thinking you've put into the user experience is exceptional. Um, I really want to know what the other mascot choices were. So aside yes. from the penguin, what came next? Well, um, we also had a pelican. <laughs> so I really wanted the pelican. Yeah. I've like like got nothing else to say. No, look, it, it's, a, it's a really nice touch. Um, a couple of questions. What happens when you hit the interpreter button? Because um, it's right early in the process, so what goes from there? Do you want to, do you want to say it? Yeah. 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 If, well, you've, you remember you've got like two and a half minutes left. Right, so, okay. yeah. <laughs> so one of the uh, objectives of this app was not necessarily was to alleviate some of the burden yeah. that uh, Glenn would have in taking phone calls. So the app, uh, so if they do need an interpreter, they're directed to call Glenn Ken, yep. which is what they would ordinarily do, so they can organise an interpreter, and they can potentially use the app to fill it out with an interpreter. Uh, so they can still utilise the app in that way. Yeah, no, it's a great idea. Um, I, what's the impact from a Flemcam point of view? So the, the, uh, I, I can see the triage aspects of this. I can see the, 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 um, uh, how much work it's taking away and you know, the, the process that you've created is, is really nice. So do you have a sense of the impact and the, the reduction of volume of work that they need to deal with or, or the additional amount of work they can cope with because of the app? Um, so when we first met with Flemken, the current process that they've got is obviously an, an intake process via phone call. Uh, and what that means is that all the human resources are pretty much going to that initial call. And so what we thought is that if we could develop this app, which we did, that would eliminate that call, which means that those human resources, instead of, you know, being that an hour call, which it could often be up to, people that are, you know, able to fill the, the app out themselves do that. And that means that those human resources rather than being directed to a call that um, can be done on an app, those resources are really dedicated to those people that need them. Because we do understand that those people that do go to Flemken, um, you know, they come from all different sort of ethnic backgrounds, which means that um, we really want to sort of streamline that process and really allow Flemken to devote their resources to those who need it most. Yeah, no, very good. Look, you've, you've made something very complicated look really simple, so well done. Yeah. Hey, 
The uh, next group is the group for the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders Women's Legal Service of North Queensland yeah. Yeah. with the Child Safety Act. 159,000 is the number of Australian children who received protection services from child safety last year. Statistically, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander children are eight times more likely to receive protection services than non-Indigenous children. Those who are from remote areas are even more likely to have an encounter with child safety than those from major cities. So good evening. My name is Burnett Wang, and in my group, we have Alaris Bosco, we have Betty Choi and Ganaji Amendi, and we are the proud creators of the Child Safety Guide for Women. Our client, the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Women's Legal Service from North Queensland, offers legal advice, court representation, community legal education, and outreach clinics for Indigenous women. First, we'd like to thank Kathy Pereira for being our main contact at the legal service, as well as Angela Carroll, who is here with us tonight, Erica Kyle, and Juliana Pascoe. Their knowledge of the law and collaborative efforts in working with us proved invaluable in the technical development and design of the application. We'd also like to thank Gary, the law school. We'd like to thank Pip, Shah, and Ben for making all of this possible. This is a mobile application, and we'll assist Indigenous women by informing them of the child safety process. Our client wanted a mobile app because the majority of the users are Indigenous women in remote areas, and they may not actually own any desktop computers. However, they may have access to mobile devices. From the beginning, a key consideration was the fact that our end user is the Indigenous mother at different stages of the child safety process, some of whom may have low levels of literacy. They may be undergoing extreme stress due to ongoing child safety investigations, and they may also be facing a number of risk factors at home, including family violence, substance abuse, or unstable housing. In recognising these factors, we aim to achieve two key objectives. Firstly, to build an app that can deliver on its intended purpose of assisting Indigenous mothers, and secondly, an app that can do so in a user-friendly manner. At this moment, we would like you to put yourself into the shoes of the end user as we go through the Child Safety Guide for Women. Thanks, Barnett. So we wanted the ind Indigenous woman to be at the core of the Child Safety Guide, both in terms of the process of making it and the final result. More specifically, we wanted to align ourselves with the values and the work of the client in furthering the interests of the Indigenous mothers. It is for this reason that we placed the diary, the logo of the client, as the centerpiece of our app. The woman in the center holding the child is the organization, and the flower represents the beauty of the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander woman. You will also notice the dark color scheme, which creates a sense of calmness and is less glaring for the eyes. As we chose to create a mobile app, we needed to ensure that we have a slick, simple, and functional design that looks professional, but not over the top. Most of the text is also left aligned, so the user can scroll as they read it, and the screen has also been optimized for the width of a mobile app. We have gone through numerous design iterations, starting from the bare formatting on, on Neota to the incorporation of icons, including Aboriginal symbols, to ensure, sim to ensure simple yet intuitive visual elements. We also made sure that whatever design elements we include do not crowd up the screen and provide a more stressful experience for the user. In terms of functionality and content, we essentially created three apps in one. This allows mothers who are at different stages of the child safety process to, accept, to ac access the app for different purposes without being bombarded with unnecessary information. First, we have an educational section which provides information to users on each stage of the child safety process. Second, the main function of our application is to help the user assess exactly which stage of the child safety process they're at. Finally, the support services referral function helps mothers address risk issues they may be facing. All throughout the app, you'll notice small details and small touches that reflect the huge effort we really placed on ensuring accessibility for our end user. On numerous occasions, our client mentioned to us the low levels of literacy that our end users face. And for that purpose, from the onset of our app, we include a notice informing the user to find a friend or a relative to help them if they have any problems reading English. 
and how do they read this? Which is hard. Please find a friend or a relative to help you. We have this notice in the beginning, but nonetheless, it's a function that carries through throughout the entirety of the app, and you will find it as a function with all of our questions. For the other part, as we delved into the depths of child safety and child protection legislation, we realized that it was a very obscure and complex part of law that was hard for even us as law students to understand. And it was no wonder that Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander mothers were finding it hard. And because of this, we have decided to put an effort to use easy English throughout the entirety of the app. And this was only possible through numerous iterations, emails back and forth with our clients. Um, we had extensive user testing, not only through our client, but also through other proxies, other mothers around us, other non-legal -le students and um, people that we had um, close to us. We believe that our education section really showcases the accessibility of our app. It breaks down the complicated child safety processes into four clear stages. When a user clicks on one of these buttons, it takes them to a new page. Here, the different elements of the stage are explained, both using video and an extremely simple educational illustration. <coughs> Stage one, assessment, notification. So you will note that the person in the video is none of us. It is in fact Erica, who is an Aboriginal staff member at our client's organization. She, she and her team were kind enough to record these videos for us. After untangling the legislation, we, in conjunction with the client, arrived at the four stages of child safety. There are 30 pathways in the application which lead to entirely different outcomes. Tonight, we will be showing you one of them. Our first stage deals with low-risk mothers who still have their child with them. Their journey will end here. Our mother, Maggie, who has had her eight-year-old son removed by child safety, is panicked and needs further information. Answering yes to the first question, automatically sends Maggie to stage two, as indicated by the progress bar at the top of the app. While that might not mean anything to Maggie immediately, it is one of the many ways we visually flag the journey. The questions on this page determine whether the mothers have been to court yet and some of the potential orders. The calendar function allows Maggie to refer to her order directly and input the date, taking out the guesswork. The questions on this page address what we call stage three of the process, the family group meeting. By the conclusion of the meeting, Maggie has a case plan which provides clear directives for the health and safety of her child. For some mothers, the process will stop here. The report provides two pathways based on a calendar variable. If the meeting has taken place, the app requests additional information to ensure mothers have not already moved into stage four, and if the meeting is upcoming, we provide advice accordingly. However, Maggie is contesting the child protection order and the app proceeds to stage four. This set of questions determines whether there is a court ordered conference coming up or if the mother is getting ready to contest at a trial along with conditional follow-up questions customized to the mother. Before Maggie receives the final report, she will be able to access the support services portion of the app. This is a crucial aspect as mitigating risk through support services is vital for proving capacity to child safety. Our icons are accessible and intuitive. Maggie is able to send a PDF copy of her report directly to her email of choice. Additionally, she can quickly exit out of the app at any stage and find herself rerouted to the ABC News homepage. This is a protective feature as mothers are often facing concurrent domestic violence orders. Maggie's tailored report advises her that she is in stage four of the process and what she should do, such as speaking to a lawyer. The report provides her with relevant information based on her inputs, explaining key concepts of child safety in a linear way. The visual signposting, such as the green ticks, outline important actions a mother should take, and the drop-down boxes condense relevant but non-essential information. 
Because Maggie has indicated that she has mental health concerns, our app is providing her with a referral to the Townsville Aboriginal and Islander Health Specialist Service for her to get specialist assistance. This icon is interactive. Maggie can click on it and it will bring her directly to the services website. Lastly, at the bottom of the report, there is an option for Maggie to get a lawyer to contact her. If she chooses this option, an email will be sent to our client flagging the urgency of the request. Our client is the only community legal center specializing in advising and advocating for Indigenous women in North Queensland. In the future, our app will be of assistance not only in North Queensland, but to all Indigenous mothers in the state going through the child safety process. We are incredibly proud of the application we have created. We hope this app will help contribute towards the incredible efforts our client is making. We've been honored to play a small part in the greater journey towards enhancing access to justice. Uh, thank you very much. Obviously, uh, a piece of work where you've spent a lot of time working through the complexities of the issues with your collaborator and you've captured the complexity of the challenge that you faced and so thank you very much for walking us through that. I thought some of the ways that you rationalised how you put the act together visually and your ambition through the use of plain language and the strategic use of video was really exciting. And it seemed, the way I heard you describing it, that you're trying to, in fact, humanise the app for the end user and draw them into a sense of being a part of a community that was there to assist. And I think to that extent or to that end, um, it, was a, it was a really uh, nifty way to bring... Um, the human voices into the design of what you did. So so very well done. I really am interested to hear from you the challenge of trying to design an app here in Melbourne for a community that you can only really come to understand through your client. You spoke very brief, briefly about how you tried to visualise and come to understand the end user, but I would like to hear a bit more about that because I think it's a very particular challenge for, for this application. Yeah, so um, it is a challenge, the geographical distance with our clients. Uh, they're on the other side of the country. But um, working with them has honestly been a pleasure because um, they've been really on the ball with giving us feedback and we've made sure that through every single stage of our app development, we've kept them in the loop, we've sent them prototypes, uh, we've sent them documents of stuff we wanted to incorporate into the app and they were able to give us feedback. Um, during the user testing phase, we did what we could in Melbourne with people we know, strangers on the streets, for example, um, mothers, and uh, we've even consulted a graphic designer to just uh, see from a design layout perspective would be the best layout for a mobile app. Um, on the end of our clients, they were um, very good in uh, testing the app amongst their staff members and also at one stage I believe they were able to test with a mother who has gone through the process. So um, we just basically took any forum or feedback we could and implemented uh, language design and accessibility uh, feedback wherever we could. Quickly ask a follow-up question. To what extent did you feel that um, the fact that you'd never been on site, you'd never been on community, raised the bar in terms of a challenge or not? I should have asked that of the other group as well, but um, I, I would be interested on that because there's a question about how we equip for cultural competency to do projects with communities in which the law school isn't always fluent. To a certain extent, I think there were many obstacles, not just in terms of physical distance, but in terms of subject matter. Um, even if we were in Townsville, it is, probably, it is highly likely that it would be hard to get in contact with mothers that are actually going through this process. Um, in that sense, we were, I think the first step that we took was really to go through and scour through the website. And our client has amazing reports and stories of the actual clients that um, tell that what happened to them and what were the cases. They shared some confidential documents with us which showed what kind of safety plans the mothers went through and what kind of processes they went through. And through those snippets, they were snippets, but we were able to take a glimpse into what it is and what the life of a mother in that situation is.
The second last group is the group for the Mental Health Legal Centre. Your treatment, your voice. Great. Thank you, everyone. Um, my name is Peter Turner, and with me are Christina Poon, Johnny Udell, and Richard Zhang. Tonight, we are proud to present our application, Your Treatment, Your Voice, for Mental Health Legal Centre. Before we begin, and bear with me, I'd like to take this opportunity to thank Charlotte Jones, Sarah Duane, and Graham Morris from Mental Health Legal Centre, Associate Professor Michelle Taylor Sands and Dr. Carolyn Johnston from Melbourne Law School, Dr. Pierce Gooding from the Melbourne Social Equity Institute, Dr. Linda Cader from the Royal Melbourne Hospital, and our teacher, Gary Caslay, along with Ben and Shah. Now, that may seem like an Oscar-worthy thank you list, but with their expertise and guidance, we've created an incredible app that is not only sensitive to the client base, but beneficial to Mental Health Legal Centre and insightful to external practitioners. Through our meeting with the centre, we were instructed to create an app that helped facilitate the drafting of advanced statements. Under the Mental Health Act of Victoria, an advanced statement is a document that sets out a person's preference in relation to treatment in the event that that person becomes a patient. The purpose of these statements is to put the power of the person's treatment into the hands of those who are actually receiving the treatment. They're an incredibly important document as they can be used as evidence before the Mental Health Tribunal, as well as advocacy for patients under compulsory treatment orders. Despite the empowerment that, that they provide, these documents can be quite detailed and require a person making it to strongly reflect on their mental health journey and think about their future wishes. This can be quite daunting. Hence why only roughly 2.5% of Victorian adults in the mental health system have an advanced statement on record. Clearly, there is an issue regarding the access and exposure of this beneficial tool. On top of this, the drafting process can take up to six hours to sit down with a lawyer and facilitate this. If we consider the 110 advanced statements drafted last year by Mental Health Legal Centre, that is roughly 660 hours that the centre's time could easily be reduced through the use of technology. Through the use of our app, we have two aims. To produce a detailed advanced statement report that the client has considered before their meeting with a lawyer in order to increase the efficiency of the drafting process, and on a larger scale, to increase access for people within the mental health system to draft advanced statements and ultimately create a culture shift where people are positioned to embrace the power that the Mental Health Act of Victoria provides. By embedding our application on the Mental Health Legal uh, Centre website, our app will empower people to take their mental health strategy into their own hands. Now I'll hand over to Christina, who will run you through some of the design features of the app. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. My name is Christina Poon, and I'll run you through some of the design features we implemented. When designing the app, user experience is at the forefront of our consideration, and that's why we undertook multiple sessions of user testing at Mental Health Legal Centre and consulted relating experts in the field. So without further ado, let's go. Um, as we land on the first page, you'll notice the blue colour scheme we chose. We chose this colour because it's psychologically calming and often the preferred colour in the mental health space. Research, however, has shown that in individuals who've been in the hospital for an extended period of time have shifted their parent, uh, preference to a green or teal tone, so we've used that as our accent colour. On the right corner is your access your report button. We learned from user testing that it generally takes between 30 to 40 minutes to complete the app, so it's crucial that users can leave but retain a copy of their answers. Second, some older users have expressed that they do not have a private computer, so they'll have to complete this in a place like a public library. The button also allows them to exit the screen with personal information quickly and protect their privacy. From the progress bar on the, on the top, you can see that the app has five distinct sections arranged in a way where the less personable questions are asked first, such as general questions before treatment preferences. We do not ask for personal information until the end, and I'd like to flag that at no point are users obliged to provide personal information. They can still access their end, end report um, even without putting in personal information. And we've included video and text summary to anchor the user, let them know what to expect in each section and provide any trigger warnings at the beginning of every section. Hi there, welcome to the Mental Health Legal Centre, your treatment, your voice application. 
We hope to assist you in taking positive steps by creating an advanced statement. Videos are a more personable way to communicate and we think that this is particularly important for sections like treatment preferences where distressing questions are often asked. Um, and as Peter has mentioned earlier, users often do not know what an advanced statement is, so we've included um, a high-level overview in easy English in a conversational tone with pictures to illustrate legal concepts. We've also included an example of a redacted advanced statement from the get-go so people have a visual um, understanding of where this app will take them. And finally, um, we also let them know um, that there's three steps to, to this app. This is the first step to complete the app. And then they should have a conversation with Mental Health Legal and finally receive their advance statement. Now I'll hand over to Johnny to run you through the app. Thank you, Christina. Hello, my name is Johnny and I'll be running you through the substantive questions of our application. We pre-filled a number of the questions from the perspective of Sophie because um, the app is quite extensive and can take up to 30 minutes to complete. The app opens with general questions to check whether the user is based in Victoria and whether they would prefer questions to be asked in their native language. We've included Chinese and simplified um, in both simplified and traditional at this stage. It is important to note that early on, that at no stage in the application do we ever suggest the answers that a user should give or use language that forces them to answer in a certain way. Our opening pages collect information on the values and goals that Sophie has outside of her direct treatment. On this page, we ask questions surrounding Sophie's diagnosis. Initially, this page was set up for Sophie to list out her diagnosis and to react to how she feels about them and whether she agrees. However, we found through user testing that it's quite often that a user uh, might agree with one diagnosis, but not another, so we've added this functionality. Sophie has caring responsibilities in her life. She has a pet dog, and she has a plan in place that if she's ever hospitalised, um, how she can care for that. She does not wish to include these information in her report, though. Sophie does not have a long-term GP, and she is not sure if she has a support person. Um, so for any keywords, we've included definitions in pop-ups. She partakes in yoga as a calming treatment and there's no dietary requirements. In this next section, we'll ask questions surrounding specific treatments that Sophie has experienced. This includes a page dedicated to ECT treatments. Due to the nature of this treatment, we've included both written and video warnings of these upcoming questions. We found that this was very important due to the very sensitive nature of these questions, and some of them cannot be asked in a written form sensitively. Sophie is currently on a compulsory treatment order, and the application will ask her relevant questions surrounding this information. Please note that she's not comfortable asking questions about ACTs, so this, these will not be provided to her. However, if she is comfortable, these will appear So Sophie has a number of treatment goals, both short-term and long-term, and these are very important for her in um, how she wishes to be cared in admission. Only now do we give Sophie the option to personalise her information and become identifiable. We make it clear, both through written and visual form, that this is not required. Um, but if she is willing, then she can proceed and enter in basic details that can be pre-filled into our draft advanced statement. Um, this serves two purposes. First, to save time for our legal centre when they are first admitted. And also, um, so Sophie can realise what type of information she will need to provide on the day during her interview. Um, we then have a few um, options for whether she can sense to have the various reports sent to people. And we found that this was very important for our users who do not want this information in anyone's hands outside of the MHLC. And it's a pleasure for me to now introduce Richard who will walk through the output. Uh, thank you, Johnny. My name is Richard. I'll be going over the output. So after the interview concludes, the app will collect the answers and prepare two reports. We have designed our reports to include information that are important from the perspective of those who will be reading them. 
The user will receive a tailored report that outlines the next steps to completing the advanced statement. It will also contain a transcript of their interview, and if there are key questions which the user has chosen not to answer, the report will explain why they're important and ask the user to, and ask them um, to be reminded um, and, and think about them in preparation for their uh, in-person interview at the clinic. This reflects uh, the educative function of the user report. MHLC will also ref will receive a different report by an email if the user consents. To assist the center in planning their interview, this report will highlight the questions which the user had chosen not to answer. The app can also pre-fill a pro forma advance statement with the user's personal information if they so request. An important element in the output which I have learned after speaking to tribunal members and experienced psychiatrists is the importance of the date of drafting. Having a date allows them to know whether a newer advance statement has been made and to help with knowing whether at the time of drafting the user was well and had decision-making capacity. Overall, our design output reflected a balance between sorry, our output design reflected balance between efficiency via document automation and ensuring that a user feels in control over the drafting process. Finally, our app, we see our app as much more than just passively recording information. As Peter has mentioned in the beginning, we hope that by digitizing the process of drafting an advanced statement, we can encourage and empower more people to take control of their treatment plans, create a cultural shift where the advanced statement becomes a key consulting document in the eyes of health practitioners, and initiate the process of creating a central repository of advanced statements. Thank you very much. Thank you. At the moment, um, the advanced statement under the Mental Health Act is really a tool for someone to document what their preferences are, um, much like an advanced directive. So it doesn't it doesn't necessarily have to be respected. Um, by treating teams or tribunal members. It's merely a way to express what your wishes and preference are so that to empower people in that position. So there is um, no appeals process. It's merely a document allowing people to see that. But like like we've all mentioned, we think that um, with the process of digitising this, that hopefully there will be more and more people actually creating this document and make it a more important and cons consultation document for it, both the treatment team and doctors. And in that sense, I guess, make it um, the, a path of some further appeal process. And in addition to that, there's also um, not a direct appeals process, but if your, um, anything on your advance statement is not adhered to, you can bring it to the tribunal and within 10 days you can get written reasons behind why that treatment was given to you. And we feel like this is really important for the transparency between the user and the mental health system that's often so disparate. Yeah. I think also ultimately, as I stated earlier, that two, like roughly 2.5% of Victorian adults actually take advantage of the benefits that an advanced statement can provide and it's interwoven all throughout the Mental Health Act. And I think if we create this access of it through technology and more people get on board and we increase that 2.5% to a larger figure, the legal validity of it gets an even stronger force as long as the, um, the social force behind it. And I think that was really highlighted in our user testing, our second round of user testing, when I sat next to a younger um, user within the mental health space. And initially we created this app in order to increase, increase the efficiency of drafting them at the Mental Health Legal Centre. And suddenly when you start talking to young people and you see the future of the sector and who's going to exist within the space, you're like, hang on, they're quite tech savvy and they're knowledgeable of the space themselves that they're in. So therefore we want to provide a platform that they can go through the web and access it. So therefore the social validity of it increases further and I think the effects will be phenomenal. And I think just broadly that um, the the issues we face with wills and events directives and event statements are, it's, it's very much a mirror. Um, there's issues of whether when people draft it, there is, they have decision-making capacity, whether it's valid, whether it complies to legal um, validity standards. So I guess to the extent where we put in the consideration in making sure that this event statement are up to those standards, they're very much transferable across wills, events directives and event statements. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Great. Thank you. Thanks.
Thank you. And we now turn to the final application. So very soon you'll be able to vote. So the final application is for the Asylum Seekers Resource Centre Human Rights Law Area, and it's called Asylum Seekers. Good evening, everyone. I'm Z Kui, and together with my team, Michael France, Yan Jun He, and Wen Zhang, we have developed Asylum Seek for the Asylum Seeker Resource Center. Um, before we launch into our app, we'd like to thank Gary Kazale, our teaching assistants, Shaw and Ben, Neota Logic, and specifically Kenji Yamada, as well as, most importantly, the team at ASRC. Now, Dr. Carolyn Graydon and James Clock were instrumental in providing us with guidance and feedback for us to build this app. First, we'll introduce our client, ASRC. ASRC is an asylum seeker support organization in Australia. It is located both in Fuscray and Dandenong, and it is, it is run by a team of um, both volunteer and paid staff. Um, the ASRC provides aid, justice, and empowerment programs to over a thousand asylum seekers living in a community seeking refugee protection. They endeavor to empower asylum seekers through self-determination and educate the community about asylum seekers and their rights. And here is a cap screen of the question flow of our app from Neotologic. As we can see, the process of applying asylum in Australia is extremely complicated. There are so many steps in the whole process, and at each of the stages, there are several alternatives which will lead to totally different outcomes. And uh, as for our users, the asylum, the, uh, the asylum seekers, they are usually come from um, non-English speaking backgrounds with varied levels of literacy in their own languages. Therefore, the purpose of our app is to help bridge the gap of information accessibility and to reduce the pressure on the ASRC by providing accessible, accurate, and detailed legal information to asylum seekers. In addition, our app will also serve as a community legal education platform, which will be a valuable resource to individuals supporting asylum seekers, to non-legal service providers, to asylum seekers, students, as well as members of the public who are interested in this area. So, as might be evident to you, this is an area of law which is incredibly complex and with the slightest level of misunderstanding can be potentially devastating. As an example, failing to meet a single deadline for one of the administrative bodies dealing with asylum applications can result in the permanent disqualification of an individual from asylum regardless of the merits of their case. The challenges faced by our team to design this application would turn an incredibly complicated, bureaucratic, alienating and opaque area of the law into an easily understandable roadmap often to users who lack English language skills and who may have been the recipients of past trauma. To this end, we've created the application to be as visually appealing as possible, and Z and I will take you through a typical illustrative user experience of a person potentially who may have arrived in Australia and is currently seeking further information about a situation. So to begin with the application, partitions users into a number of discrete categories based upon the initial questions such as their arrival in Australia. In this scenario, the applicant may have arrived by plane, and after which they can be prompted to ask exactly how it is they may be requesting help. In this scenario, a user might want more information about an application procedure they've already begun, but have not yet heard back from, from the department. By asking the initial questions, the application is able to effectively identify the specific situation of a particular applicant in the asylum process and direct them to a dynamic page. On each of these pages, the applicant will be given the opportunity to ask questions and receive information about specific steps relevant to their stage, as well as to move through the app with further prompts. And as you can see, something that we have included on every single question, every single answer option are infographics. Basically, this helps condense meaning into meaningful images. And we did this because so many of our users um, do speak English as a second language. And here, for example, say if they have been asked to complete health and character checks, there's a heartbeat there to indicate. And when they click on that, they get sent to a page that basically provides them with information about the process. Now, because this area of law is so complicated, we did have stricter language requirements, so things that we had to put on there. But to break up the text, we did include links to, and also descriptions, 
to various administrative bodies, et cetera, that were relevant to them, as well as graphic images, and also samples of documents that they might expect to receive and have to fill out. So obviously this is a question process which can be repeated in many different places throughout the application. Once a user has satisfied themselves that they've met the question requirements on a particular page, they can maybe be taken back to the previous dynamic page where they can continue through use of the application. From the current situation, the user might present with three options of how to continue. Either to exit the application altogether, to request a specific referral from the ASRC, or to ask about the subsequent step in the application in the event that their application is ultimately rejected. Once again, they can then be directed to a subsequent dynamic page, again relevant to the situation the application has identified for them. In this scenario, you may suppose the applicant wishes to know about further guidelines with the Administrative Appeals Tribunal. In that situation, they're presented to an information screen, which also has the added functionality of thereafter referring them uh, to the question of what if they have missed one of these deadlines. If this is the case, the application is able to identify the situation the user may be in a position where they require urgent and sensitive legal help. From these various exit points, it's possible for the user to then request further contact with the ASRC. This is the only point in the application where users are required to enter any personal information, and the result being the creation of a personalised report to the ASRC to help further questions. Finally, throughout the entire application process, the system has been recording and remembering the entire user experience, which is then able to be downloaded in a simply understood and formatted report, as well as giving the option to download it in a PDF document. Now, obviously what we've demonstrated here today is only a very small subset of the entire application which we have on display. Ultimately, this is an application which covers the entire asylum process, including initial protection visa application, post-application, dealing with administrative appeals authorities, uh, bridging visa requirements, and ultimately up to appeals to the federal courts. In creating the application in the form we did, we tried to give users both the ability to quickly find some information relevant to their particular circumstances, as well as having the option to explore the asylum circuit process as a whole. The first thing we noticed when we went to the Asylum Seeker Resource Center headquarters was the fact that there was a lot of um, effort put into making sure that everything felt welcoming. Because after escaping your home country and having to face all this administrative red tape, often asylum seekers don't feel very welcome. And we wanted to emanate emulate, sorry, the goals of the ASRC, which was to ensure that the system was welcoming. And we did this by incorporating custom graphics. Everything um, has been designed and formatted for this application. Here you can see four different iterations of just the title page. And we did this to ensure that the graphics were exactly what the ASRC, what the user, what we believed was most, was most suitable for the app. And as well as that, you can tell that a lot of um, the design choices, such as the infographics, were put together with the thought of the fact that these people might not speak English as a first language in mind. So further to those language requirements, we're obviously also building functionality in the future for the application to be presented in multiple languages, such as Arabic, Urdu, and Peshtar. In addition to that, the app is also currently fully mobile functional. We've refrained from displaying that because it still requires a lot of formatting. It requires the to redraw absolutely everything to fit <laughs> onto a mobile screen. Thank you. You may have noticed a pattern to our questioning. <laughs> which we because you're lucky last, we're all going to ask you questions. Just, oh, oh, oh. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, that, look, your graphics are beautiful. It's, it's a very impressive you. application. You've done a great job. I think you, you mentioned at one stage that you were trying to take an opaque area of law um, <clears throat> and convert that into an easy-to-use roadmap, and I, I think you've achieved that. So well done. Thank it, you. It, it's excellent. Um, I also thought your job titles were the best that we've seen in the presentation <laughs> so far today too, by the way, so well done. Thank you. I, tried um, hard. I, I think, I guess my question, I, you, you've put a lot of, lot of thought into the user, user experience with this and, and, and um, I, I think the effort to make it feel welcoming really comes through. I, I think you've nailed that really nicely. Um, I, 
help me understand the um, amount of time and, and effort that that will save for your client um, and the, the impacts that that will have for your users, I guess, in, in, in you know, that experience. How, how, what's the impact that you, you're expecting this will have? Well, something that we noticed when we first met with the ASRC and they told us the questions that they sort of wanted us to ask, mm -hmm. which included right at the front, just the question about um, how did you arrive in Australia? And there's by boat, by plane, which both of them have different um, criteria and options. But then there was also, I was born in Australia and um, I'm not in Australia. And there are just these things where um, the, the ASRC gets bombarded with so many questions that could be quite easily answered. So the way that page works is that if you click, I was born in Australia, it'll just take you to a page that says, sorry, um, the ASRC can't help you, but here are some other legal re resources. Um, and so we like to think it would save them time. This was designed to be a community legal education tool. Yeah. And so a big part of it is simply just about educating people about deadlines, about rights, et cetera, things that are shockingly hard to access just by Googling, just because because the system is so opaque and you know the team at ASRC are excellent but they're so overworked I'd imagine like I can't even begin to imagine what they do every day for asylum seekers so hopefully it would help just yeah. with simple things that you know people can help themselves with. Um, we, we, did you have the opportunity to test it with um, well the, your, your ideal end user? Um, and how did that go? Because it is a complicated thing that you set out mm. to achieve. I'm just interested to see how successful you were able to, to um, bring it down to the point that it is easily understandable, the, the content's easily understandable. So unfortunately, due to some sensitivity issues as well yeah. as simple workload, we weren't able to access the desired end user, which would in the end be ASRC clients. Yeah. Instead of that, we instead tried to use tests across a broad base of people, um, notably just people in our own social circles, trying to also focus on individuals who we knew who did speak English as a second language. <laughs> that actually did reveal a large number of important innovations to us. For example, you may have noticed on some of the pages, we split the questions into two rows of questions uh, which you might want to ask information for and questions which will take you somewhere else in the application. Yeah. That was actually an innovation which uh, seems quite obvious now I'm talking about us, but initially we had just grouped all those together, which was a very confusing uh, experience mm -hmm. for people who had to then try to navigate in that form. So every step of the process, we try to take those kinds of lessons to make uh, the, the application, the interface as intuitive, as simple and inobtrusive as possible so people could quickly find information or people could spend more time exploring the system and educating themselves about it. Mm -hmm. Also, just really quickly, we also want to pinpoint that um, the ASRC has been super helpful with this one. So uh, in that example of the four different title pages, mm -hmm. so one of the ones that I designed was like a girl in like a sh and with like a shapes of waves, and I totally didn't intend that to be <laughs> um, a, a little like, uh, but the ASRC told us, we were like, that resembles ocean waves and might be triggering. And those were just things that I, I didn't think about, yeah. but they definitely helped us see. Yeah. Oh, excellent. Thank you. Well done. Yeah. Well, we've come to the end of the presentations. Here comes another exciting part of audience participation. When you've voted, you'll be allowed to have a drink. <laughs> so, it's... Uh, it's Yep, that's yeah. it. So, on this page and in your program, you'll find the website address. You can go to the website address, you can vote once and for one application. Once you've voted, go and have a drink. The judges have already disappeared, nobody noticed that because you're all on your phones. <laughs> um, so we'll have about 10 minutes, make a vote, have a drink, and I'll let you know when the judges are back and we'll hear about the People's Choice Award and the judges award. Thank you. Thank you for voting. I have the People's Choice Award here in a sealed envelope that has been provided by not that accountancy company that did the Academy Awards one. So uh, I'll open it and see what it says. I was handed this just a moment ago. Hmm?
the People's Choice Award for 2019 is the Police Complaint Portal. get some photos later on I think because we're now going to move to the next thing so take a seat cool. we weren't quite sure when they announced the people's awards at the Archibald so we decided to run our own um, agenda so I just do want to take an opportunity to take to say a few quick things in closing every group got up and congratulated and thanked everyone that they'd worked with and the people that had helped them. And for a moment, I felt like a very proud mother that every student at the law school had understood how collaborative the projects had been and was so articulate and exquisitely open about um, recognising that collaboration. So a comment from the judging panellists was that we wanted to commend each and every one of you for your presentations. They were superb. They were thoughtful, and it was like going to one of the best moots across the globe, watching each of you present different aspects of your work. So well done to every student in the room. You, were, you really were outstanding tonight. Now, John said he won't speak tonight, so I'm going to attribute a couple of comments to him. And the first comment that he made as we withdrew to reflect was that the first time this subject had run, was run, probably any one of the groups would have run a prize. That the standard was high, uh, the sophistication was high, the way you'd reflected and built on your work was uh, very clearly evident to all of us. And again, we think you've done exceptionally well. So there are heartfelt congratulations from the panel to everyone that put forward an app tonight. Now, by this time, you are all supposed to be in a frenzy of excitement waiting for the final result. But just before we get there, I do want to take one last quick opportunity to thank those uh, members who are here tonight and all the people that stand behind them in their workplaces back at the various organisations, the seven organisations with which you partnered, for their generosity of spirit in coming on board with this project and their commitment to work with you right through to the end. So if we could... Just one more time, please, thank as a law school and its students, the collaborators. Um, we thanked Neoda Logic uh, uh, on numerous occasions tonight. We thanked HSF on numerous occasions tonight. But I do want to remember the incredible smoothness or note, the smoothness with which tonight ran, which is a credit to a lot of people, but uh, Gary, Ben, Shah, fantastic. Um, to have an evening without a computing glitch was uh, really remarkable. <laughs> so well done, all of you. Well done, all of you. Now, without further ado, there are going to be some specific comments and a final winning team announced. Um, as you all know, we were asked to assess all of the applications um, on, a, on, well, there was five factors, um, usefulness, completeness, design, ambition and creativity and presentation. So six, I guess, but yeah, five. Um, I would really just echo everything that Pip said. It is quite staggering to um, come and sit and observe um, how much you've all achieved in such a short period of time. Um, I, particularly honourable mention to Repair Logger. I, what you set out to achieve um, it was incredibly ambitious and I really was amazed at what the amount of work that you're able to complete within a single semester. Um, I would really love to see that one funded. I think it has a clear application um, and it's definitely something you should, should pursue. Um, whatever you do after this, um, that's one that you really should take forward. However, 
um, having deliberated long and hard in a room just down there, um, we came to the unanimous conclusion um, that the P Police Complaints Portal was the winner for the night. Well done. Yeah. Feel free to say whatever you want now. <laughs> um, I guess, first of all, I think we'd really want to thank Gary and Shara and Ben for coordinating this amazing subject, and obviously the client, Flemken, for, you know, beside, they're extremely busy to, and they took the time to help us every step of the way, gave us useful feedback. And obviously the team, I think um, we worked really well together, and I think that. I guess baby shows in our product. Um, is there anything else anyone else wants to say? Um, yeah. Um, funnily enough, I actually only knew one of these people before um, we started this project, and that was that was Ali. Um, and I've had it has been a pleasure working with Rajesh, Alyssa, and Rob. Um, we all had our own strengths. Um, some of us weren't as great at the platform as some of the others. So what, well guys? Um, <laughs> <laughs> I think Gary knows. I think once he opens up the Orbost uh, app that we submitted, he'll uh, he'll know who actually did our app. But anyway, um, but yeah, so it's been great working with you guys. I think this subject's great. It's something that's totally different to everything else. It beats doing a three-hour exam or submitting a 6,000-word paper. So I've thoroughly enjoyed it, and I couldn't recommend it all enough. Thank you. Well, there'll be a moment for some photos. Um, thank you for coming along. Thank you for all of your support. And please, there's people over there with drinks and more food. Please spend some time and have a chat. Thank you very much.